Welcome to the Doc C. Bracey Center for Human Reconciliation. My name is Paul Bracey. I am the founder and president of the center, and I'd like to introduce my team, our team that makes this session possible and all the other events that we do. Our chief operating officer is Wilo, Randy Wilding, who is coming to us from Hawaii. Our Let's Talk events coordinator, Joanne Zittick, who is coming from Massachusetts, where I'm coming from also. We have another part of the team that is part of the panel, and I don't know how that happened, but Peter Raymond was our audiovisual coordinator. And then we have Stephanie Durkrell, who I would say is our Zoom operator, background work, chat room coordinator. Um, so that's kind of the team that brings things to you. And I'm very proud and honored to introduce this evening our guest speaker, Dr. Chantal Pratt. And I'm going to read some comments about her as a way of setting the stage for her. She is a professor at the University of Washington with an appointment in the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience, and Linguistics, and at the Institute of Learning and Brain Sciences. Her interdisciplinary research investigates how real brain designs combined with our lifetime experiences to shape unique ways each person understands the world and operates in it. She is the recipient of several awards for her work. Now, I want to caution you, because when I read all of that, you're probably going to think, oh, this is going to be so boring, because <laughs> she can't talk to us, you know. The other thing is, why is it important that we understand the brain? Well, one of the most important principles in our approach to eradicating racism and other forms of oppression is the idea that thoughts and emotions determine our behavior. Now, if you think of our brain as a central computer, all of it is contained there, our thinking, our emotions, and our behavior. So the better we can understand how the brain sets us up, then we can understand the challenges we face. And in dealing with somebody that we're trying to engage to share and come along with us on this journey, what the challenges may be for them. Okay, so it's it's... It's important that we understand that. Okay. This evening, Dr. Pratt will share her insights in an easy to understand manner, sprinkled with humor, and respond to some of our questions. Now, the best way for me to kind of set the stage for her spirit, more so than her academic qualifications, is her quote that I came across the other day. And I think she may have quoted somebody else leading into her quote, but it's being equal does not require us to be the same. My dream is to live in a world that appreciates and celebrates differences. How can we have freedom without safe and supportive spaces to be ourselves? So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pratt to talk to us this evening. Good evening, Chantel. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Paul. Wow. If I didn't know better, I would think that you already saw my talk. I could kind of <laughs> stop here. I think you've hit all the high points and and I'm deeply, deeply grateful to be invited into this space and to share what I know with you as promised with some very selective humor for people who like very medium jokes. <laughs> so let me share my screen just a second. We practice this. And here we go. Can you see my title slide? Somebody, I can see Paul. So you, if you can give me a thumbs up, if you see my title slide, that'll be excellent. All right. Hopefully we're good to go. So tonight I'm going to talk to you all about shortcut stereotypes and preparedness in the brain. And as Paul led, I thought I would start out by talking and just addressing the question um, for those of you in the room who are doing on the ground work, trying to eradicate racism and bring humans together, who might want to know what the heck a neuroscientist has to do with it. 
Um, I want to start by positioning myself as a mother of a Black child who has a deeply invested interest in understanding um, where these systematic biases um, and prejudices come from. And I also want to say that, um, as Paul said better than I did, um, what can a neuroscientist tell me about prejudice and stereotypes? Well, I think I can tell you where they live, where they come from, and how they shape your behavior, which seems like a pretty good start to addressing the problem. And I hope you'll agree. Okay, so this is what we're going to go over today. Um, now, just as an um, example of how prevalent shortcuts, shortcuts, stereotypes, biases are in the brain, I thought I would just use some dictionary definitions to describe what those words mean. Because even a word, which can feel very objective, brings with it a kind of lifetime of experiences in which you have heard or read that word. So some of these words might feel neutral to you. Some of these world, words might feel charged to you. And just to set some common ground, I thought I'd read the dictionary definitions and tell you what I mean when I talk about shortcuts, stereotypes, and um, preparedness. Okay, so I think for most people, shortcut does not have a negative uh, connotation unless you think someone's taking shortcuts that affect the quality of a job you might have asked them to do, for instance. So the uh, technical definition of a shortcut is a shorter alternative route or a quicker way of doing something in order to save time or effort. So what about stereotype? For me, stereotype becomes more of a charged word. We often think of the word stereotype, or I think of the word stereotype, when I think of somebody kind of prejudging me or a person who belongs to a particular category. And as a neuroscientist, I thought I would Google, do an image search of the word neuroscientist to kind of illustrate what I think of when I think of stereotypes. So the definition in the textbook of stereotype is a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. So if you look at these images, you'll see that thankfully the internet has become wise or the people who manage these searches now realizes that a neuroscientist can be more than just a white man. But there are still some really funny stereotypes that make their way into these images if you do what I do for a, limit, a living. The most salient of, this, of these for me is the white lab coat. Unless you're working in a wet lab with animals or doing surgeries, we do not wear white coats in our day-to-day -day life. But this is something that's been, become so synonymous with science or scientists that the internet is full of neuroscience pictures with a white lab coat. They're also all looking at these really sci-fi images of brains and not just tables full of numbers or uh, screens full of words or email, which is what I, like many of you do for the vast majority of my day. Now, what about preparedness? I think this is really interesting because when I thought about and um, tossed around ideas for the titles of this talk, my first association with preparedness was really like the Girl Scout or Boy Scout, Cub Scout um, idea of being prepared for anything. You know, it's like um, having knowledge and skills and being ready, a state of readiness. But the actual definition has a connotation of being ready for bad things. So a state of readiness, particularly for war or disaster. And I think that's really relevant to what our brains use uh, shortcuts and stereotypes for, just to do a little foreshadowing. And I felt like it would be, uh, I think we probably all have a good idea of what a brain is, but I felt like it would be doing a disservice to my favorite organ if I didn't give it equal attention to the other uh, content words in my title. So a uh, brain is an organ of soft nervous tissue contained in the skull of vertebrates, functioning as the coordinating center of sensation and intellectual and nervous activity. And I wanted to actually use this definition to um, introduce what I do and what I've been doing since I become became fascinated by understanding the relationship between the mind and the brain at the individual level. You see, not only is the brain this organ that helps you, that not only helps you, it forms the way you understand the world and operate in it, 
Your brain is an organ that makes you you. Anything that changes your brain would change your sense of self. And when I first learned about this as a young student interested in medicine, I became completely obsessed with understanding how different brains see, sense, and decide and operate in the world in different ways. So this brain that I have on the screen here to introduce the idea of what a brain is, is what you would see in more than 90% of neuroscience research or textbooks that tell you how the brain gives rise to the mind. This is not, it looks like a picture of actual brain working, but what it really is, is a statistical average. It is a summary of what a group of people do on average when you put them in a magnetic scanner and have them do some sort of task. So a huge amount of our theories and the research that tells us how brains give rise to thoughts, feelings, and behaviors looks at this one size fits all or a group average approach. But actually, if you look like I do at the data that goes into an average like this, so these are real individuals, these are all healthy young adults reading a single sentence in a scanner. There's huge amounts of variability. And for the past 26 years or so, I've been um, doing research and developing techniques to try and get our theories to explain not only why brains on average do different things when you ask them to engage in different tasks, but why two individuals doing the same thing might use rather different parts of the brain and rather different amounts of the brain to do so. So what is it that drives brain variability? And what are the implications for how we understand the world and our place in it? So today I have a lofty goal. Um, I've got a little less than an hour before we start our Q&A. And I want to summarize some of the parts of my book, The Neuroscience of You, How Every Brain is Different and How to Understand Yours. In particular, I want to go through the ADAPT chapter, which is really about how our experiences shape our brains. And the connect chapter, which is really about how our brains shape the way we understand ourselves and others. But um, if you find yourself wanting to know more, you can go to my website, which is just my name, ChantelPratt.com, and you can play uh, games there that will give you instant feedback on how your brain works. And I'll give you information about where to find the book as well if you're interested. I also want to do a little shout out to John Amici, who's part of my inspiration for trying to link the way the things that I know about how different brains understand the world and operate in it with thing, questions like the Doxy Bracey Center is interested in. And in an interview with Adam Grant, John Amici was talking about the kind of um, experience he has when people see him in person. And for those of you who don't know who John Amici is, he's a former NBA player. He's a wonderful organizational leader, coach. Um, you can look him up. He does all kinds of really, really great things. Um, and um, he was talking to Adam Grant about um, things that he does to sort of ameliorate the way people feel when they see him embodied as opposed to the way they feel when they just hear his voice. And he said things like having a bookcase in the background, wearing a beard, and that these are th all things I have to do because people are distracted by the case that carries my brain. I thought that was fascinating and it made me think a lot about identity and how much of our identity is tied to the way that we look on the outside and how much of the way that others understand us is tied to the observable data um, that they are exposed to. So thank you, John Amici, for that quote and for all the work you do. I'm going to start with things that I want you to remember from this talk, just in case I do get boring and don't break, don't keep Paul's promise of being a little bit funny and engaging. There are three things that I want you to remember about shortcuts, uh, stereotypes, and preparedness in the brain. The first is that your brain has to use shortcuts all the time to connect the dots on incomplete information. So I think many of us know this, but the, the reality that your brain creates for you is so convincing. It's one thing for me to tell you your brain is using shortcuts and connecting the dots, and it's another thing for you to open your eyes, 
or ears or whichever senses you rely on and see or hear a continuous or feel a continuous stream of information and have the illusion that you're moving around the world like a camera with a complete set of data. This is simply not true. Our brains are brilliant and powerful, but they are finite and they take in the world in discrete bite-sized chunks. Everything you perceive as continuity and as a kind of completion happens because your brain is figuring out what must be going on based on incomplete data. And that's those are the shortcuts we're going to talk about today. So if you look on this screen here, many of you will see what looks like a um, transparent cube made up of black edges up against a black, uh, black background with kind of white polka dots. A few of you, based on my previous experiences, might see this the depth of this object as reverse. You might feel like you're looking through a black box with light holes or white holes cut into it, and you might see that, that cube as within the box. And now that I've said that, some of you may reverse your um, perception. But here's the deal. That black cube does not exist. So what actually exists on the screen are a series of white circles with black line segments um, sort of intersecting or interrupting them. And if you, depending on how big your screen is, if you're watching this on a phone, it might be really hard. But if you actually focus your eyes at the place between circles, where you think that line should be, you'll see that there's nothing there. Oops. Now there's really nothing there except John Amici. Anyway, um, you'll see that there's nothing there. Your brain has assumed, based on your lifetime of experiences, that there is a black line that connects those two line segments or each of the line segments that occur within those dots. That's because in life, it's much more likely that a solid object will go will be partly blocked by some other object than it is that two things. So for instance, I don't know if you can see me, but right now my head is blocking part of a photo uh, picture of brain frequencies behind me or a um, filing cabinet. And it's much more likely that something will be partially occluded than it is that there are two separate objects that are exactly the same orientation, exactly the same color. So your brain just creates it. It just decides it's there, fills in the blank for you. No. So take away one, your brain uses shortcuts based on incomplete information. And now, okay, here we go. Now, our assumptions based on these shortcuts shape the way we understand the world. And these are not just assumptions like, I assume that if you are young and female that you hold this level of status. We're talking about very primary perceptual assumptions. Like what color is this dress, right? Remember the dress? If you've ever seen me give a talk anywhere, you've probably heard me talk about the dress. I continue to be obsessed with this phenomenon. Um, not because people can't agree about whether this is a blue and black dress or a white and gold dress, or maybe you see something in the middle like blue and gold or blue and greenish, but because people are so taken aback by the possibility that we might interpret the same physical stimulus in a different way. Well, the way your brains are trained based on your previous experiences shapes the way it connects the dots. And the dress is one of many of the ways that this might show up differently for people with different experiences. We're going to get into that a little bit more in a bit. And the last thing I want you to say is that these shortcuts and these assumption, assumptions we make also shape the way we connect with others. It turns out that brains of a feather flock together. And this is my new best friend, Pearl the Otter. And I'm not here to say that I have an otter brain but I'm not not going to say that I have an otter brain because I very much enjoyed her company. That's for another talk. So let's get started. Let's dig into where these stereotypes come from and how they work. 
the first thing I want you to consider is that the human animal is born with very few instincts. In this slide, I've used a picture of Conrad Lorenz, not only because I think he must have had the most exciting life of any biologist or person studying animal behavior. Um, he seems in every picture like he's just having a great time with his geese that were imprinting on him, for instance. But to set up the kind of smart ways that nature prepares animals to exist in their particular niches of the world with the way that nature prepares the human animal to exist and occupy every niche or many, many, many niches in the world. So babies, human animals are born with a learning instinct. And um, if you have not spent time with tiny babies, or if you do not have a developmental background, what I want you to understand is that when the human baby is born, it's completely helpless. Not only is it completely helpless, it does not understand what is happening, very little of what's happening around us. It does not have shortcuts. And therefore, as um, William James put it, the baby is born into one great blooming, buzzing confusion. And a lot of the work of our brains as we enter our particular niche of the world is to develop a database based on our lived experiences that helps us figure out what is going on right now so that we can be prepared or predict what's going to happen next. If you haven't seen the movie, this is kind of an old movie now, uh, Bebes, it's a French movie, but they have an English version. This gives you a really um, salient example of the commonalities and differences um, that can unfold in human development. So this uh, movie follows infants through the first, I don't know, year or two of life in dramatically different um, cultures and contexts. So from Mongolia, San Francisco, I believe somewhere in, in the US and Africa, um, they follow these adorable babies through um, their lives and their growing early growing experiences. And it's um, interesting to see the things that happen in all cultures and the ways they unfold in sort of different contexts. But I'm going to give you a concrete example from the science of my friend and colleague here at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, Dr. Patricia Cool, And that is language. Just to give you an idea of how we begin to make sense of the blooming, buzzing confusion that we're born into based on our lived experiences. So babies are born what she calls citizens of the world. That is that a newborn baby through the age of about six months can hear and distinguish all sounds that occur in all human languages. So we can listen to their brain responses or we can look at their behaviors and their looking and their attention and even listen to heart rates and look for signs of engagement. And we can infer, make strong inferences that when a baby is born, they are capable of learning any language that they're exposed to. But by around six months of age, they start to get better and better at the language or languages that their caregivers speak. And at approximately the same time, they start to get worse and worse at the languages they aren't exposed to. Our early brain responses are setting us up to understand and become experts in the things that we're exposed to but they, this also creates kind of selective excellence. So as we get better and better at the information that we experience, there become areas, shadow areas in things that we are not using, that our brains say, oh, I don't, I don't need whatever that frequency is, whatever that combination of sounds is, I have not heard it, therefore I don't need it. And let me show you how this actually works. And so um, for many of you, any adult that has tried to learn um, a second language knows that it's challenging. It's challenging for a million reasons. That could be a whole nother talk. Um, but it is very hard to hear the sounds that don't occur in your native language. 
And after puberty, this becomes even more apparent. So the basic mechanism by which expertise and adapt adaptation to our environment happen in the brain is the same thing that drives these shortcuts. It allows us to fill in the blank or connect the dots based on incomplete learning. And that is a process called Hebbian learning. When I was an undergraduate, I heard the catchy phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. And that continues to be the way I understand how heavy and learning works. So I've um, drawn a picture here of a uh, virtual connection of neurons. So these circles on the screen are supposed to be individual cells in the brain. And there are kind of inputs, the little forky looking things and the little funnel looking things are outputs. I want you to understand that I'm giving a very simplified account of how this works. I don't know, there are 12 or 15 neurons here. You have 86 billion neurons in the human brain. Some individual neurons are connected to up to 10,000 other neurons. So when you try and understand how you become sensitive to the sounds of your native language, and all the other interesting things that we're gonna talk about today, know that this has to scale up. But in essence, this is how heavy and learning works. If two or more neurons on, in the brain that are close enough to one another come online at the same time and go offline at the same time, and this repeats, what happens is that the brain grows new connections between these neurons. If this happens enough, the brain decides this is repetitive information. These two firings are part of the same pattern. And so if later, at a later time, only one of those neurons come on, comes online, because there are connections between the neurons and as those connections grow, activity will spread from one to the other, recreating the pattern. This is the way your brain fills in the blanks with incomplete information. And simultaneously, as you can see over here on the right-hand side of my um, figure, a huge amount of early learning happens in the pruning of neurons and synapses that we're not using. So we're really trying to tune our brain to be ready and to understand the particular kinds of phenomenon that we're exposed to. One of the things that we've really learned as a field in the last, I would say, 10 or so years is that this, what happens as a result of this Hebbian learning is that we create this internal model. Um, sometimes it's called the default mode network or the resting state network, but these intrinsic connections between your 86 billion neurons strongly shapes the way you see the world and operate in it. In fact, if I bring someone into the lab and I ask them to do a particular task, like read a passage or tell me what emotion is present on a face or do a math problem, the overall metabolic activity in their brain might change three to 5%. We spend a massive amount of energy maintaining and updating this mental model of the world. Once we are no longer babies in the blooming, buzzing confusion, but adults that move around the world understanding things in real time with tiny bits of information, we're relying on these statistics encoded in the connections between our neurons, and we need less and less data from the world out there to actually decide what's going on. So what might these shortcuts be for? I've already told you that our brains are finite and they're operating in a infinite and dynamically changing world. And, and I wanna show you how we use these, uh, these shortcuts to understand things in short period of time. So I'm gonna try and simulate this by just flashing a picture on a screen for about, depending on within the limits of PowerPoint's technical prowess for about a quarter or a third of a second. So I want to ask you, I can't see you or your chat, but I want you to ask you to think about what you saw, what you noticed in that picture. Some of you were like, doh, I looked away for a fraction of a second and I saw nothing. And that's fine. But depending on your attentional biases, things that you're familiar with, um, 
including my face, you may or may not have seen a lady with a big smile walking her dog in the woods. And I realized that my shirt, dogs are greater than people, is highly inappropriate for a, a talk for a center for human reconciliation. But I love people too. I just love dogs on average a lot also. So forgive me. Let's play this game again. Uh, for those of you who looked away, I'm warning you, I'm going to flash something and I want to know what you take away from it. Ready? Here we go. What did you see? So this uh, picture is of a man walking a goat. Uh, this guy walked his goat across country, found the picture on the internet to illustrate something that actually happened to me in my neighborhood. Um, I like dogs. You saw it on my t-shirt. I walk my dogs a lot and my brain can recognize a dog on the end of a leash in my neighborhood with very little data. I also know a lot of dog breeds and I'll say like, oh, that's a cute Pomeranian or a Skipper Key or what kind of, you know, is that a Newfoundland or, you know, or all the mutts and try and guess what kind of mix it is. But one day we were walking our dogs down the road and we saw a man walking two goats. This is where we get to the preparedness part of this um, lecture. My brain saw a person with leashes and animals about this size. And literally it was like a record scratching. It I could feel the does not compute happening when my mental model of the world was faced with information that was inconsistent with my lived experiences. I have seen a lot of goats in pastures. I had never seen a person walking a goat down a city street in Seattle proper until that day. So what are shortcuts for? Uh, there for helping us to understand information with very little time or with only a sample of what's going on around us. And one example of such a shortcut is a stereotype. So when it comes to um, these, this database or this mental model based on our lived experiences that we use to understand the world as it's unfolding around us, a stereotype might be thought of as a kind of core set of connections that are related to some category or some role or some type of person. So here I pointed randomly to what you might think of as, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you might think of these gold uh, networks of connections as being uh, activated for something like neuroscientist or dog or mother or um, store owner or, you know, so for any a category or concept, your brain will bring on the most common connections, the most common co-occurrences for free. And that is kind of a skeleton, right? So it's both not always true. This is what's true most frequently or on average. And I don't remember the second thing, both not always true and incomplete, right? So all the ways that dogs differ, all the ways that moms differ, all the ways that neuroscientists differ are not there in your core mental model. This is just kind of the skeleton that you bring to flesh something out that you're seeing onto. And I think it's important to note that the reason, the real reason for shortcuts and stereotypes is that our brains are motivated to make decisions in real time that move us toward good things. So we're prepared. If we understand we have a limited amount of time and we understand what's happening right now, your brain also learns, okay, these are the actions I can take that will lead me to good things. Your brain is, uh, is motivated to understand what is in any given time so it knows what to do to bring something good. And similarly, our, the human brain has two pathways, not only one that learns how to find good things based on what's going on around you, but one that learns how to avoid bad things. 
based on what's going around you, right? So preparedness in the brain is using shortcuts to figure out what is happening right now and use those to predict what's going to happen next, given different actions. So I want to take a second at this kind of intermission and drive home the point that shortcuts and stereotypes in the brain are not inherently bad or nefarious. In fact, they're necessary. So this is a picture of me and some friends at a horse gathering, a horse conference of sorts, and we're just having a conversation in a noisy room. If I did not have shortcuts, if I did not have this mental model, if my brain had the capacity to take in all of the energy around me in that room, by the time I had processed it and had some like fully fleshed idea of what was going on, minutes would have passed. So in a live conversation, 10 milliseconds is the difference in timing. You need to understand if I'm talking about a ball or I'm talking about a Paul, like Paul Bracey, 10 milliseconds. So imagine being in this conversation in this room and I just figured out what someone said minutes ago. It, it doesn't work. So we need to have these shortcuts to figure out things in real time. We need them to cross a street. We need them to have a conversation. They're necessary. Here's a fun example. I told you I was obsessed with the dress. Here's a fun example of how our experiences shape these shortcuts and, and shape our decisions. So not a lot of people know that the dress that took the internet by storm because we couldn't decide if it was blue and black or white and gold came from a person taking a selfie to, to ask a friend whether or not they should wear this dress to a wedding. So in at least Western, at least American cultures, brides tend to wear white and white or, or some version of off-white. And it's considered quite rude to wear a, dra a dress that is white or some version of off-white if you are not the bride. So in reality, this dress is blue and gold. And when the person took the picture of herself wearing the dress and sent it to her friend, the first thing her friend's like, you cannot wear that dress. You can't wear a white dress to a wedding. And her friend was like, the person wearing the dress was like, what do you mean? This is a blue dress. And they were like, no, it's a white dress. And the friend who was evaluating whether the dress was wedding appropriate sent it to other friends and, and somebody put it on the internet and it became, it took the world by storm. So again, this was a question about a perception that was going to drive a decision, wear this dress to a wedding or not. And a fun fact uh, discovered by Pascal Wallish in about 2017 is that your experiences with natural light drive the extent to which you will see this dress in e as either white and gold or blue and black. So the dress is actually blue and black, as I've mentioned. And for those of you who see white and gold or blue and gold or some lighter version, what's happening is that your brain is deciding that the dress is backlit. It decides that the dress is in a shadow. And so it automatically subtracts out the blue and black from the scene, leaving you seeing white and gold. Think about how quickly that happens and how no matter what I tell you about what color the dress actually is, you will still see the dress in the center is the actual original dress. And I've exaggerated it so other people can see the other perspectives on the left and right. So people who spend a lot of time in natural sunlight, including larks or people who wake up early in the morning, are more likely to see the dress in, as white and gold. I once gave a talk in Florida and literally 95% of the people saw white and gold, which I thought was fascinating. Here in Seattle, where I live, there are plenty of people who see blue and black. We spend time in artificial lighting with the light coming from above and we don't see a shadow. So just pause here and think that you might have learned at some point in your life that the color that you perceive an object to be is directly related to some physical property in the world, which is like wavelengths of light and the way that the wavelengths of light hit your retina and your cones, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, 
if that were true, we would see things changing color in the sunset and when they go into shadows. And instead, our brains do what they always do. They use context and our previous experiences to decide what color the light that's hitting the objects is and subtract that out from our from our early perceptions. So just think about how that might scale up to more abstract concepts like freedom and justice and equality. Here is a way less fun. So this is where we record scratch and go from funny to serious example of how our shortcuts shape our decisions. So social science has had a and and psychology as a whole has had a bit of what we've called a replication crisis in the field which means that famous studies when they're done over in a different group or a different context don't replicate. What I'm going to show you here which is the relationship between faces and whether we perceive a weapon or a tool has replicated dozens of times in populations of all races in many different age groups and in many different locations over the world, but particularly in the United States. Um, this was a study uh, by Keith Payne in 2001 in which the task of the participants, the original participants were college undergraduates, was to judge whether the image they were seeing flashed briefly on a screen, like the images I showed of uh, myself walking the dog and the goat, they, they flashed these images very briefly on a screen and asked people to judge whether it was a weapon or a tool. Now, the manipulation of the experimenter was to put a male face between weapons and gun, uh, weapons and tools. So the instruction was ignore the face. This is essentially like a fixation cross telling you that the next trial is going to begin. But what the experimenters found was in a series of um, different manipulations that um, following a black face, there was a tendency to be quicker, not only to be quicker at recognizing a weapon, but to be much less, to make many more mistakes and recognize a tool as a weapon, identify a tool as a weapon. Now, let me show you what the data look like, because you might have heard that before, but the data themselves are very telling. So I'm not going to ask you to read this whole graph, but you are, or this whole table, but you're willing to, more than willing to, more than able to, if you're interested. So what we're looking at here in experiment one is um, how quickly these are reaction times or response times people identified a weapon or a tool when it followed the black face or when it followed the white face. So you have gun in, in the top row and tool in the bottom row, black faces and white faces, and these are the average times. Now, what pops out here is that it's you are the fastest in all of these conditions when a black face precedes a weapon. And based on everything I know about how brains work, this must mean that there is an association in the brains of these participants, or at least in the brains of most of these participants, that links a black face to a weapon such that when these participants saw a black face, they had partial activation of the pattern associated with a weapon. When they then saw a weapon, they were faster to identify it, they were prepared. Or when they saw a tool, sometimes they misidentified it as a weapon, having partially been prepared to see a weapon. Uh, I don't need to remind you, I hope, if you're in this room, what some of the tragic real world implications of this are. So these are three beautiful faces um, who were shot and killed because they were holding something that was not a weapon, a wallet, a toy gun, or a cell phone. This is how it happened in the brain. What can we do? I'm going to go deeper into this, don't worry. But the first thing I want to say is slow down when you can. It's hard if you're having a live conversation or crossing a street, but those shortcuts come on fast, as fast as you can see the color of a dress, and they affect your feelings subconsciously. When you're making important decisions, 
slow down. It allows you to consider more information. We'll go into this in a little bit. Also, what we're going to talk about next is become aware of where those shortcuts come from. Remember, as babies, we're born into a blooming, buzzing confusion. What is driving the database that creates the shortcut between a black face and a weapon? Okay, so this is important, really important. Where do our shortcuts and stereotypes come from? So I've told you about how the things that we experience in the world shape the connections between our brains and create this mental model or this perceptual lens that we use to move around the world and make decisions about how to find good things and how to avoid bad things. But what counts as an experience? What trains our brain? Now, I bravely and vulnerably asked a group of undergraduates in my lab because these are, are in my class because these are the population that this experiment was a, originally run on. How many of you have seen a gun in real life? There are a lot of guns in this country. How many of you have seen one in real life? And how many of you have seen a gun around a black face? I didn't even say in a black hand. Who? How many of you have seen a gun in real life paired with a black face? And the answer was zero in my population. So I'm asking you, what counts as an experience? Where do you think people see an association on average, right? Everybody has a different lifetime of experiences that's shaping their brain. Where do you think these associations between a black face and a weapon are coming from? So the truth is that every mental experience shapes your brain, shapes your shortcuts, shapes your preparedness. And that includes the media, uh, you know, your digital devices, which are now so smart that they feed you exactly what they think you want to see to keep you feeling right and secure in the world. And also your imagined experiences. So if you're worrying about worst case scenario and you're playing it out in your brain, um, that is creating and changing the pathways in your brain that you use to form your operating system. And what I believe these studies show us is that we have inherited the narratives of the majority groups in our respective cultures. So we have not only walked around the world inhabiting the bodies that we inhabit in the cultures and neighborhoods that we inhabit, we have consumed the media of people who look like us and live lives like us. And we've consumed their narrative of others. And that has become hardwired into what we expect and what we're prepared for. I think it's a problem, at least something that we should be very aware of and something that we can target as an avenue for change. So that brings me to an important point. And that is like, how do our explicit beliefs interact with this database or teaching. So I'm very proud. This is a, these are two shelves in my current bookshelf at home that was not at all staged. And it's got a lot of stuff on there, a huge variety from memoir of Ralph Macchio to how to be an anti-racist to range to some good fiction, including the overstory, which is all about trees and people's lives and a story about a female knight and some horse stuff. How does what you read in a book or what you think you feel um, interact with your database? In my book, I call this the horse and the rider. This is my horse, Kiara, and I. So your database, as I've described it, your the, the way that the connections in your brain that are based on your previous experiences shape the way you understand now and the way you move toward good things and move away from bad things is like a horse. This is the way that every other behaving animal on the planet moves toward good things, learns to adapt and operate in their environment. This is a big part of what drives our behavior. You might heard of it as implicit cognition. You might he have heard of it as conditioning or programming. Um, or subconscious mind, those there are conscious glimmerings that might you might have you might think of it as intuition. But these 
this information is stored in the connections between all of your cortical neurons. It's a lot, it's everywhere in the brain. And the part of your brain that I'm talking to right now, the part that understands language and instructions and reads a book and has conscious access to the way you think, feel, and behave is most likely the prefrontal cortex. It's an evolutionarily very new part of brains. And it's incredibly flexible. Um, as I'm going to show you in the next slide, it it impacts or influences all of the other parts of the brain. But using what you know, what you learn explicitly, or what you believe, or what your values are to drive this horse, you know, your, your bigger, uh, computationally um, easier, more automatic ways of behaving is hard. It's effortful. If you're, if, if, you know, if you haven't slept a lot, if you are distracted by something else, if you are under, if you don't have enough nutrition, that the horse will drive your behavior. And at any given time, your decisions are driven by some combination of what you know and what you've learned by your previous experiences. So just like learning why people see the dress as white and gold or blue and black didn't change your perceptions, your explicit values or the things that you read in a book are perfectly happy to coexist with these um, implicitly acquired databases based on your lifetime of experience. So what I want you to understand is that knowing better doesn't always translate to doing better. And that's because you may have competition between things that have worked for you in the past or the way your brain has been um, conditioned or the way it's been fed on other narratives and the way you want to be. We'll talk about what to do about that in just a second. I want to show this picture. So this is a theoretical model from a paper called The Partisan Brain that also gives you some kind of inklings into why some of our um, explicit, uh, conscious value-based beliefs can be sticky in the brain. Um, and why some people can be resistant to change when faced with a lot of evidence that the way that they're operating is not based on the reality that they're inhabiting or is harmful, et cetera, et cetera. So these prefrontal parts of the brain this one in particular, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex holds values that your when your brain is trying to decide how to behave, it's estimating how likely something is going, how likely different outcomes are to happen next and how good they're going to be. There's a value center of the brain. And this is this um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. We are all driven to seek good things and avoid bad things, as I've said previously. And so one of the things, one of the most central things that we're about, that we're driven to do is to protect our identity-based beliefs or value-based beliefs. So when we come in contact with information in the world that's consistent with the way we believe, the things we want to believe, we turn up that signal our attention, so you can see that this these arrows go back to attentional control, perception, memory. We turn up the signals on the things that we're expecting because they make us feel correct and safe and right. And we turn down the signals on things that we're not expecting or that are inconsistent with our value-based beliefs because they make us feel vulnerable, other, and wrong. So this writer part of the brain, the one that's, you know, can organize and control these other systems is motivated to protect its and uphold its beliefs, even though doing so is effortful. So I want you to add my, uh, to the, what can we do? Slow down, become aware of what information you're feeding your database. Like when I'm watching, a, my husband loves scary shows. When I'm watching a scary show, 
and I hear someone's bones cracking, I'm like, ah, I don't want that in my database. You know, being aware of what you're feeding your database, that becomes the model that your brain observes the world through. I want you to add to that practice. And we can, pr it's lovely that we have this ability to pull the clutch on reality and imagine things. We can expose ourselves to other practice other perspectives. Our imagined experiences shape the way we operate and understand the world. And I was fortunate enough to see Barbara Kingsolver speak here in Seattle. And she said, don't stop reading fiction. Just because it's not real doesn't mean it's not important, especially if you read fiction from authors from different backgrounds and different cultures. They allow you to inhabit a character and, and move through the world as if you were that character and some piece of that character's lifetime of experiences comes away with you and shapes you. So we need to practice. We need to go to the mental gym and inhabit the world that we want to live in. And as part of that, I'm going to give you a few things for your database. This is my friend and the father of my child's hand. So here is a little bit of, uh, of um, information about other things that you might see in a black hand that I think is beautiful. And that's my daughter, Jasmine. And here he is 28 years later carrying something that I think is also important, and that is science. So there's two instances for your database or a few million other ones to go up against, but I hope that helped. So last but not least, I think I've got about 10 minutes left. I want to tie this into how we connect with and understand people, particularly if they're coming from a different place. And in order to explain that, what I need you to understand is that the, in order to know someone else, in order to feel like you know someone else, I think we what we want to do is understand the experiences that drive their behaviors. We want to understand how they think and feel. And what we have available to us is only how they behave right? And I think this is really interesting and limited because even as I started this talk by talking about how words bring with them an index of our lifetime of experiences and the context that those words come in, even language, which I think is one of our most specific behaviors, even if I tell you how I feel, the words I use, the gestures I use are imperfect. So to know someone else we are put in a situation to reverse engineer them to try and figure out what's going on inside their mind and heart, if we talk about emotions, um, metaphorically, based on observable cues. Now, this is complicated. There is so much info. I told you that language is, you know, we need to understand what's going on on a millisecond by millisecond basis. We have, you know, facial expressions, gestures, we have prosody, whether my voice goes up or down, am I shouting? The data, the energy that goes into observing another and trying to figure out what's happening on the inside is one of the hardest things that a human can do, in my opinion. So of course, our shortcuts are going to come into play here. Now, humans are social primates. And we are born with a set of instincts for learning from others. And these instincts actually form the horse version or the vast majority of the way that we understand one another. And they're called mirror neurons. I like to show this slide just because it's an, an example of how mistakes can be really um, important uh, and can teach you much more than perfection. So this slide or this graph actually comes from the lab that discovered mirror neurons. And this lab was trying to study motor coordination, which is probably interesting to somebody, but seems kind of boring to me. They've got um, electrodes listening to the part of the front, the very backside of the frontal cortex that controls how you move your body in these monkeys. And they're, you know, trying to elicit a particular movement in the monkey by putting some kind of a snack on the board. And they're listening to the part of the brain that coordinates that. And what they discovered on accident was when the experimenter placed the treat 
on the board using the same motion that they were trying to record from, the monkey's brain went crazy. So we called these mirror neurons, and it was the discovery that our brains understand the actions of others some, by, by simulating it. We have these mirror neurons in the brain that watch a behavior and, and act as if you were doing that behavior. So the same population of neurons drives that behavior in you and helps you understand that behavior in someone else. Here are some examples. This is Edie. And babies learn. So you may have seen the uh, Andy Meltzoff studies where you see a newborn baby sticking out its tongue because the, the face is looking at a sticking out its tongue. Babies are really um, driven to understanding others through this mirror neuron system. So you can see her kind of opening her mouth as I'm opening my mouth. And I want to say that we don't really grow out of it, or at least Jasmine and I haven't necessarily grown out of it. Our instinctive way of understanding others is still through this simulation system that watches the behavior of them and emulates how you would be doing that thing, what your brain would be doing if you were behaving in that way. Now, there's a smattering of studies, an increasing number of studies that suggest that these mirror neurons may be involved in empathy. And the reason I have an italicized maybe or may is that a lot of this research is done with pain perception. So that's not like the entire breadth of what we consider to be empathy. But if you watch somebody else experience, experiencing pain and you feel pain, this is a form of empathy or feeling with another person. And I'm going to tell you that in a minute, that empathy comes up as a solution to a lot of things, but it works really well, like mirror neurons work really well, if indeed the brain that you're trying to emulate actually works like yours. So what happens if your brain is simulating what you would be doing, if you're watching a, a set of behaviors and you're trying to understand them by going through the motions of what you would be doing, if you were engaging in those same behaviors, however, your brain is trained by your own unique lifetime of experiences, and you might be doing something completely different, or you might be coming from a different place if you're engaging in that same activity. In fact, social neuroscience over the past just five or six years has provided a ton of evidence that we gravitate towards people whose brains work like ours do. So in this study, the data I'm showing you here, uh, conducted by Parkinson and colleagues, was a group of uh, graduate students at a university. What they did was take create a social network based on, I think it was around 500 graduate students. They said, are you friends with, you know, here's a list of the other 498 graduate students. Are you friends with A, B, C? If People were direct friends with one another. They come up in this first column, social distance one. Um, if they were not friends with one another, but they shared a friend, they had a social distance of two and so on and so forth. If they had a friend that was a mutual friend of two others, so social distance of three, et cetera. Then they took a subset of these people and they put them in a scanner. And what they found was you can predict who would be friends with one another based on how similarly their brains responded to a series of vignettes that they fed them. So the red, uh, the, the areas of the brain that show up as bright red are highly correlated or similar. And the areas of the brain that show up as bright blue, which you see in the more distant groups, are dissimilar. So... My intuition is that this is a two-part process. One is that we are going to gravitate towards people who have had similar life experiences as we have, and we're going to gravitate towards people who like similar things that we do. And both of these things shape the connectivity in our brain and the way we'll respond to these different vignettes that we're looking at. But another thing that's going on, I'm, I'm assuming based on the, the story I've lined up here, is that our instinctive way of understanding others, this mirroring, works 
when somebody is coming from a similar background as we are, when somebody has a similar set of experiences as we do, and we simulate their behaviors and we make assumptions about what's driving them, we get it right more often. And when we get it right more often, we feel connected, we feel understood, we feel seen, we can respond accordingly. And um, an evidence for this has shown up even in the early empathy responses. So it turns out in at least one study, I've seen three or four like this behaviorally, that these empathetic feelings of feeling with, which is often lauded as a good thing, is strongest when you when you perceive the person who is experiencing something as part of your in-group. So it turns out that things like mirror neuron ways of understanding and oxytocin or social bonding ways of understanding others, these these instinctive, fast, database-driven ways of understanding others also facilitate in-group, out-group differences. So Paul Bloom wrote a book. I have not read this book, but I'm quite intrigued by the title and the description called Against Empathy. And he's arguing for replacing empathy with rational compassion. And that's where I'm going next. Because most of us develop more sophisticated ways of understanding others. This mirror neuron system leads small children to cover their eyes and just and think that you can't see them, right? Like most of us learn at some point that you can indeed see me when my eyes are covered. And it turns out that there's a more sophisticated and more effortful and more frontal lobe driven way of understanding others, which has been called theory of mind. We can learn to understand another human in the same way that we can learn to understand astrophysics or planetary rotations or other things that we can't directly observe and have to create a mental model of. <laughs> and what's encouraging about this to me is that behavioral genetics research, research looking at twins raised in uh, different environments, suggests that theory of mind or this ability to effortfully model another mind is nearly 100% learned. So in a group of over a thousand pair of five-year-old twins or 2,208 individuals, um, what you're looking at here is the correlation or the similarity between on the top um, monozygotic twins who are nearly identi identical genetically and dizygotic twins who share on average 50% genetic overlap. The similarity in their theory of mind skills is exactly the same, which, which suggests that it's not genes that's driving our ability to understand others, but it's a shared environment. And additional work has suggested that this is a lot about the caregiver and the language they use about mind-mindedness. As a comparison in blue, I have language skills. There's a big difference between nearly identical twins and dizygotic twins in their language skills. So language is partially genetic and partially um, environmental, whereas this theory of mind thing seems to be almost entirely environmental. So what can we do? Understanding someone else with this mind modeling is more effortful and maybe less emotional. Like the the uh, the mirror neurons is comes on fast and like our implicit cognition or our gut tuition intuition, it's it's effective, it's feeling. But it has the advantage of being able to work for brains that work differently. It's teachable. And if we learn about brain differences and how they influence the way we understand the world and operate in it, I think we can come to a place where instead of saying, what the hell were they thinking, we can ask what environments and what information processing systems make that way of behaving perfectly rational for that person? Or we might even get to the place where we ask, what am I missing? And then of course, there's the, I think harder, but more important uh, boots on the ground work of forming trusting relationships, earning trusting relationships where you get feedback when you get it wrong. So go, seeking out those relationships of people who work differently in which you can tell one another. Now, that's not what I was thinking. That's not what I meant. So I want to leave with a quote from the book. And it says, trying to walk a mile in another person's shoes is bound to give you blisters if they aren't the right size. Instead, I hope you'll join me on this adventure and try walking a mile in their brains. Thank you very much. 
see if I can find the way to shop. Stop screen share. Here it is. It's a lovely <laughs> slide. Did it. Chantel, thank you so much. You're that welcome. Was, thank you for having me. That was awesome. And I know if I had some of your lab devices on right now, you'd be seeing like, beep, 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 like things would be lighting up like a, like crazy. Um, yeah, I, I have literally, I usually take notes during lectures and, and which this was an interactive lecture. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> But it's several different sticky notes that are lined up. Um, to, to let everyone know who has put in a question, who sent questions in advance, thank you so much for doing that. And if we have people that jump off right now or slightly after right now, please go out, um, either borrow or buy a copy of Chantel's book, um, Dr. Pratt's book. Uh, I think that your brain will do what my brain is doing now and what it did when I first read it and then listen to it. Um, we've got some pretty awesome questions that have come in. And I do want to remind everyone that if you have a question, please do put it into the Q&A. Um, we're going to try and get to as many as possible. I am going to triage with the ones that were put into um, the pre-event. So we're gonna start with those and um, but feel free to add as as we go. And can I add that they can also read, there's a contacts form on my website. So if oh, yes. you have a burning question that doesn't get answered, please feel free to, uh, to find me there. Yes, and Stephanie, thank you. Stephanie has already put your website into the chat for everyone. So um, you covered a lot of, some of these questions actually straight on and some of them kind of to the side. Um, you talked about how we can unlearn, potentially unlearn stereotypes, biases, and, and not unlearn shortcuts, but basically add in new information mm -hmm. or ask the questions that we need to ask in order to get a better, more, complete picture of, mm -hmm. of either the person that we're talking to or the situation that we're in or something mm -hmm. that we're observing from a distance. Mm -hmm. um, so this question is about research. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of any research that attempts to unlearn bias mm -hmm. Or yes. Sacrifice. Yeah, I I, I enjoyed that question. And let me temper with, yes, I know of some research. The last time I looked was possibly was about five years ago. And I'll tell you that the research is not encouraging. So, you know, it's something that these are often using something like the implicit association test, which I see is it here in the resources, which is really exciting. Um and looking at like untraining our associations with race, gender, age, et cetera. Of the tests that I have seen, what you have to consider is it's a lab intervention that might be like an hour or something like that, right? And um, and the truth is that these connections in your brain are changing in every moment, every lived moment of your life, not only waking, but when you're sleeping, they're consolidating and changing. You know, most of those are incremental and non-noticeable to you, but we've all had that moment where some event hit us and changed the shape of our knowledge and changed us at the foundation and changed the way we move and operate in the world. So I think that these the information that is in us and is driving us has taken our our lifetimes to accumulate. And I think that real meaningful change at this low level is working ag against that backdrop of how much data is in there. And it takes time. So I, I think that 
just because we haven't, or I haven't seen it in the lab in the past five years, doesn't mean we shouldn't start now with being conscientious about what we're feeding our brains. And I, um, so here's an example. I love an underdog story. I think a lot of people do. And recently I was reading a story about a group of um, inner city kids, uh, black kids, boys who had won this chess tournament against all odds based on completely different lifetime of experiences. And it was a very, I think it was, it was a very uplifting and informative story. But in the story, there was a lot of mention of their adversity of, you know, drug dealing and violence and poverty in their neighborhoods. And I think that these details are, are um, added to increase the drama and like against all odds, they achieve this success. But knowing what I know and taking this lens, I thought, I think these stories enforce our, our connect our stereotypes about black children because it's kind of, you know, you, you are reading poverty, drugs, violence, and then there's a part of the story that's like they're winning, but it's implied that this is against all of the things, you know, it's, it's unusual. This is the exception to the rule. And so I believe that knowing what I know, I can, I can notice that. And just like in my value-based brain can say like, this is a story about this. And maybe as science communicators, we can be become aware of like, is this a seductive detail? Is this adding drama? How are we shaping knowledge by adding these kind of associations with the otherwise uplifting positive story? So I think that we can just become aware consumers of information. And, um, and I think that we can indulge in, you know, consuming the narratives from people who have lived different lives than we have, given that we can't walk in their shoes. I think walking through their imaginations is a really powerful way to kind of shape our brains. Do you have any, I mean, we saw your bookshelf or at least one of the bookshelves. Do you have any recommendations for that? Type of, and, and you can, we, this is the beautiful thing about the internet is we can augment this mm -hmm. recording, this event with links in um, all of the, by the way, all of the attendees um, we'll, we'll get a copy of this recording and it will also be available on our website. Um, mm -hmm. we will put these contextual links. We'll put a link to the IAT, um, and, uh, specifically to Dr. Pratt's book, but any additional recommendations or resources that you might like to provide. Recently, I read, I believe it's called Our Missing Hearts, or it might be called All Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ng, NG. I was fascinating. And it really is about a, a kind of dystopian future in which, you know, American ideals, a, a sort of uh, politically determined American ideal is enforced on the way that we raise our children. I loved it. Um, geez, something else popped into my head. Oh, so I was thinking of Barbara Kingsolver. So uh, Damon Copperhead was her version of the um, Appalachian children and... Um, telling the story of the opioid drug crisis in the in the spirit of David Copperfield through the perspectives of these children. Those are two that I've read recently that I thought were really illuminating. So do, is that a way of, I mean, fiction has always been a way of, uh, I'm not exactly sure what, what, way, what term to use, but uh, especially since we're talking about maybe not using empathy, but for me, it's it's um, a way of being able to do that in a safe and constructive way. Um, so is that, do you think that that's a good way for people to kind of address the theory of mind um, and, and to, um, to, maybe fiction being a bridge into some other, another world um, and also experiencing from another person's perspective. Yes. And I think what's nice about fiction. So I, I try and do about half and half 
Um, I used to only read fiction. Uh, my my <laughs> career as a science communicator has forced me to read more nonfiction, and now I, I'm kind of hooked. But um, there's something really important and not to be understated about enjoying yourself in the process. And um, and that is not just because fun is fun or feeling is feeling. It's because dopamine, the neurochemical in the brain that that is associated with reward or feeling good, also facilitates rewiring or learning. I mean, it exists as a learning signal in the brain. We get excited when things turn out better than expected. We have a dopamine dip when things turn out worse than expected. And that happens in our virtual worlds as well. So we're really learning with these characters from the outcomes of their decisions. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be looking around a little bit because I've got a Word doc that has a running list. And then we also have Better you a, than live, me. <laughs> a live Q&A. It's, it, is, um, it is air traffic control here. Um, so what makes meaningful change difficult? Mm -hmm. I think there are two things. Uh, mm, there are many things. There are only two things. We would all be exactly as we want to be. There are many things. One is this kind of um, working against the amount of data that you've accumulated, right? So how strong are the connections in your brain that are driving the behaviors you want to change? How many times have you reinforced them? Um, how many times has that thing led you somewhere that your brain perceives as a reward in the past? You know, so it's just working against the body of data that, you know, depending on how old you are, that's, you know, scales, right? Like this moment is coming against the lifetime of experiences. I think um, as I talked about with the horse and rider, I think that it's important to understand that when you're doing a value-based change or practicing something that you've learned explicitly, that you've learned through instructions or from, from reading a book or whatever, that it's energetically demanding and that there are only like one to three things that we can hold in mind and use as explicit operating principles at a time. So if you walk into the kitchen and you're like, why am I here? It's because there was something in your mind that was driving that behavior and it fell out, right? It happened to all of us. Um, and it's okay if you get ice cream because you're just in the neighborhood. It's fine. That was probably why you went there in the first place. I'm kidding. But so, so when you're trying to change and you're using these instructed goals, be mindful of how much sleep you've had, you know, is it early decision fatigue and, and be forgiving because kind of shaming yourself for those things can also decrease the motivation and reward associated with it. And then I think in that same light of goal, like seeking pleasure and of goal directed behavior, um, change can be hard if we haven't thought about, if we only think about the behavior we're trying to change as this is bad or this isn't serving me well. It is serving you well or it has served you well in the past in some context or it wouldn't exist. So I think that um, understanding, acknowledging what is the reward value of this thing, even if it's perceived safety, right? That's a big one. Like we like to feel like we can predict and we're prepared and we can control things. So, so figuring out, doing the work of reverse engineering yourself and saying like, this thing may have served me in the past, but it does not serve me in this new environment I'm trying to operate in. Or this thing gives me a feeling of safety, but that feeling is an illusion. What's an, an, something that gives me actual safety? You know, so I think that we need to, our brains do what they do for a reason. I mean, they are, you know, driving, behaving animals around the world more or less successfully for hundreds of millions of years. So you have to say, like, how is this serving me? It is doing something. There is a need there or there is a reward there. And if you can like acknowledge or meet that reward and change the way the behavior looks, I think it will be more successful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take one of the Q&As from, uh, from our live chat. Hello. And since the theory of mind is teachable, do you have any suggestions on how to and how to teach it in the best way possible to teach it? 
I think it depends on the age of the person teaching it. But I, th- in one way, so in my humble way of using what I know, which is the way different brains understand the world and operate it, that was my real goal of this. I wrote this entire book and seven chapters were about things like dopamine and extroversion and risk-taking or about speed of processing and working memory. And my real goal was to get people to understand that their operating system is not the only operating system and it's not better or worse than someone else's operating system. Just because, you know, for me, that gives you some appreciation of the way we vary, like concrete appreciation for the way people systematically attend to different things and learn in different ways. Some people are more likely to choose good things and some people are more likely to avoid bad things. And knowing that, makes you appreciate someone who might seem pessimistic and telling you all the things that can go wrong. Like that is how their brain is wired to learn. It's related to genetics and dopamine and, you know, and it's not wrong. It's interesting. Um, But in children, the research suggests that um, parents who use language that is about mind states have children that develop more, um, a richer appreciation, a richer appreciation for the mindset of others. And I did not know I was a single mom getting a PhD and I did not know how right I was doing this. I was just exacerbated, like exasperated and tired. And I would just tell Jasmine, like, it makes me feel stressed out when you make noise and I'm trying to write my dissertation. But that thing, like just that thing, like it makes me feel this way was actually is important. I mean, I I didn't read it in a book. My thankfully my brain just led me to that solution. Um, but instead of arguing about what is, which is so tempting, even in an adult relationship, right? Like it can feel like gaslighting because you come away from a conversation and you're like, I absolutely did not say that. I would never say that because I don't think that. And partner was like, you said exactly this thing. And instead of arguing about what is, because you may be arguing about whether the dress is blue and black or white and gold, get back to the to the mindset. Like what I'm, this is what I was feeling. If if those words came out, it's because this, you know. So that's also where you, as an adult, where you get into the trusting relationships with feedback. Like instead of just getting mad or getting defensive, get curious. Like your brain is tuning into that word or it landed on that word because it was expecting that word. Where does that come from? Okay. Kind of a thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Let's see. What neurological barriers impede understanding between two people with different or opposing values Mm -hmm. and operating assumptions? Mm -hmm. I think... The neurological barrier is really our filters. So um, I do not believe our brains are motivated to know the capital T truth. I don't think any of our brain, because the truth, like 95% of it is irrelevant for operating. Our brains are motivated to learn about what's important to drive our, our choices. And I think we all feel like we're right, we know the truth, or I am motivated to understand the truth. But inherently, your brain is motivated to ignore most of the things that it doesn't deem important to it. And so when it comes to values, this is like, I think the apex thing that your brain ignore, you know, like if it's incongruent, if you feel unsafe, and and identity and belongingness is something that's so core to our safety as social animals, right? We turn down, we turn away, we resist. So from a biological standpoint, what's the biological barrier? I would say the way that our prefrontal cortex shapes, weights the information that is consistent with our beliefs, turning it up and turning down information that's inconsistent with our beliefs. And from a psychological standpoint, I think the barrier is threat, right? So 
Um, there is research that suggests that if you want to change someone's mind, the best way to do it is to listen to their perspective and let them explain it to you. And our instinct is just to to fact to ex- fact in our truth them why our way makes sense. And what that does is it creates a sense of threat, right? It creates the sense of you're coming after my protected values and beliefs, and I am turning down this. So even in the lab, if you give somebody two scientific articles, one that's consistent with your pre-existing beliefs and one that's inconsistent, they will say that the one that's consistent is better science, you know? And this is not about no matter how it feels when you're having a conversation with someone who believes different than you, it's not about general intelligence, it might feel like they're so dumb. They bully, they drank the Kool-Aid, but trust me, you drank the Kool-Aid too. And intelligence just gives you more elaborate ways for talking yourself through your version of the truth. So I think that um, biologically, it's our perceptual filters. Psychologically, it's a feeling of threat. And, and, and what could we accomplish? It's like, I don't think you can change someone's mind if you're not willing to change your own. And so I think if instead of threat, you approach the situation with curiosity, that is associated with dopamine in your brain. That is associated with the potential of you rewiring. And, you know, and I would guess that whoever asked, I don't know who asked that question, how they feel, but many of us feel like we want to understand others. And what we mean is, we want, we want to change their minds, <laughs> but it, it, you ask yourself, like, you know, when somebody, when something comes at you that you feel resistant to, why, what are you protecting? And that's important. You don't have to change it. You don't have to let go of your values and beliefs. Just understand that they shape the way that you move in the world and operate in it. Thank you. And I, I would go back to the, in your, the introduction of your book, where you clearly state, these are the things that I'm not doing, I'm not going to tell <laughs> you that your brain is better because you put your hands together and your fists are, <laughs> are bigger or, or whatever, but also that the goal is not, I'm not going to focus on telling you how to change yourself because the, the real, I mean, and you correct me if I, if I misinterpret this, but the real gist of it is you're, you're giving a little bit of the instruction manual that we still don't fully understand um, by a long shot. Mm-hmm. And that it's okay that we don't understand it and that with the information that we have, we understand and we get comfortable with the idea that there are differences right. and that we're all kind of, we're, we're cohabitating and we're, we're still functioning within this same, uh, within this shared, shared environment. Um, That's exactly right. I would like to, I would love to bring you around to talk about my book to everybody. That was beautiful. Thank you. On my my (laughs) evangelist campaign to promote your book, which I would be very happy to do. I'd also donate my brain to science, but I don't want to write it on that. Um, I always tell my participants they're lending their brain science. <laughs> <laughs> don't donate it yeah, until yeah. you don't not need done, it not anymore. Done not yet. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not done with it just yet. Um, so uh, before before I do the next question, um, just to let everyone know, all of the resources that Stephanie has added to the um, to the chat. We will also share those resources. So don't worry about not being able to save the chat in your Zoom tool. We will get that to you. And if you don't, you can always email the center. Um, And yes, if you can purchase uh, Dr. Pratt's book from a Black-owned bookstore, that would be really amazing too. Um, We're talking about the brain. We're talking about why we make certain decisions, what the shortcuts that we make. It is so much easier to buy a book from Amazon. Now, Amazon, don't get me wrong. I still want my prime deliveries, but (laughs) the way that you spend money has power. So knowing that you're supporting a small business, 
uh, an uh, independent owned bookstore, a black owned bookstore, all of those choices, those small, you may see them as small decisions, they add up. Anyway, that's my that's my commercial. Save, um, save the bookstores. We don't want them to go the way of the blockbusters. Exactly, exactly. Um, another question, a value of Paul Bracey and the Doxy Bracey Center is to bring people together. What strategies might be effective in conversation between very different, even, unex and this is in quotes, unacceptable views. And I mm -hmm. would add, and, and actually listening to what you're saying and trying to be present and internalize it, is that it seems to revolve around holding space for people and being curious and asking and showing compassion and asking for more information because your lived experience may not necessarily include um, the the perspective of the person that you're trying to understand. That's right. And, and I will add that in the call to broaden our understanding of differences, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have boundaries or that we shouldn't choose to spend time with people who are psychologically harming ourselves. But what I would say is that, so you use the word holding space. And I think that our brains are quick to judge. They are. And for the, all the reasons that I mentioned, and some of us are more judgy than others. This is an individual difference, right? We know this. You know this from your lived experiences. I don't have to tell you this. And so, you know, these quick, like, you get a feel, you know, I, I get like uplifting versions of this in my inbox. Like, I saw my best, my, this person in my yoga class and I can't explain it, but I instantly knew we were going to like each other and we've been best friends for 20 years. And she gave me a kidney. I'm, I'm making that last part up, but like, <laughs> you know, you've had these experiences where, you know, you just know, and it, it might seem magical and mystical. And maybe it is, I only know what I know, but you also have these experiences where you're like, I don't like that person. And it's fast. And it's like, I know in the, you know, in the first 10 seconds, I'm not going to enjoy this conversation or whatever, but, I do think that every person can be a teacher and every conversation can be an expand, a mind expanding one, right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to um, give power or uh, reward to that person and say like, this is the right, you did a great thing when you did something ostensible, you know, harmful. But that person has lived a completely different set of experiences. And you can say, you can understand the problems that divide us. If you try and reverse engineer that person and say, what have they adapted to? What have their inputs been? We're all born citizens of the world, right? It's not just language. We're all born citizens of the world. What has life taught that person? And I think if you just, if you can make this space for those kinds of, explain where this come from comes from conversations, we can understand the problem more deeply. We can understand what kinds of experiences, environments, cultures, people have been fed that drive these beliefs that somehow protect them, their values, their sense of belonging. And if we only other and say, this is right, this is wrong, shame, isolate, like, I only think that's going to go so far, right? It's going it, to, it, in a world where you're constantly surrounded by information that makes you feel correct, you know, your devices are feeding you what they know your brain already likes. It's, you know, it is, and it has been fueling increased division. So I think we really have to or not, we don't have to, but we can choose to make space for these curious explorations of that person without um, saying that they're correct or, you know, choosing right. to put yourself yeah. in harm. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me go back to the questions. Okay, this one. Is, oh, by the way, we've got 
folks from all over the world. Um, I saw Indonesia, I saw Rwanda, and this, these were just the folks that were reporting through the pre-event survey, um, mm -hmm. all representation from across the US. Um, gosh, there's so many questions, Chantal. <laughs> I, I, okay, so I'll, go, I'll just go to the next one. Um, this is from Emma, and I know she's in Oregon. I've been reading the inner work of racial justice by Rhonda McGee. I am wondering how the theory of mind relates to the practice of mindfulness. Could you mm -hmm. offer any advice for becoming more aware in the moment mm -hmm. so that we can interrupt our brain's automatic response? And you gave us slow down. Mm -hmm. um, you gave us, where, where am I? Become aware and then mm -hmm. practice as the three kind of takeaways. Um, but if you want to uh, elaborate a little bit to this. Yeah, I actually had a group of, I had a very successful corporate person ask me if they thought that um, meditation could correct their implicit bias. And I said, no, it, but, and the reason for that is that mindfulness is the training of that frontal lobe. You know, it's the becoming aware that the frontal lobe you could think of as the tip of the iceberg. It's becoming aware of the sort of deeper, more automatic horse processes as they bubble up into our conscious awareness. And it's, the tra you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think of mindfulness as training the writer, the writer gets better tools, it becomes more adept. And so I think that um, mindfulness practice and becoming aware of your conscious mind and learning to sort of separate out the thoughts that you're experiencing from you. These are, you know, fleeting brain states in my, through my lens, um, your writer becomes more skilled and more able to, um, shape the way the horse moves you through the world. So while I don't think mindfulness can change your implicit biases, it can change the way you operate it can change your decisions. It can, it can help you to slow down and be aware and, and notice like, oh, I feel unsafe right now. Is that real? Or is that based on these associations with this neighborhood or with whatever's going on around me? Um, and so, yes, and you know, I do practice, uh, do mindfulness practice. There are people in this, in my university who do it at the beginning of every class, which I think is really nice, just sort of acknowledge where you're at right now, take a moment to turn in and to learn to like live in this world, learn, you know, to be aware of your awareness. And there's a lot of different kinds of mindfulness practice. And I think they're very useful, but, and, but, and right. there's still this dance between the other ways of knowing. Well, I see it as being it, the mindfulness prepare could potentially prepare you for being presented with a situation that's that's challenging. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it could pre prepare you for everything, but it could also prepare you <laughs> or at least help give you a little bit more space uh, or or awareness than the immediate you know, the, the gut reaction or the, mm -hmm. the knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Okay, this is about a question of calling, uh, about calling people, uh, instead of calling people out, we call them in. And this is with regards to the activist civil rights leader, Loretta Ross. What if instead of calling people out, we called them in? Um, so that's that's from Judy. I love that. I love that. And I think that that's all part of this. You know, what do we consider our in-group? I think that I intentionally picked the picture of the otter because it's like, how far can, you know, how far can we go? We connect with and and I think that we all connect with pets better than people who work differently from us because they don't threaten our identity, right? So like, what is our in-group? Like living 
beings or earthlings or like, what is it? I mean, that's, I think that that is a malleable construct. So the benefit of being the host of the, the, the show, I guess, kind of, sort of, um, and, I'll ho and hopefully I'll be invited back to do another one. I get to ask my own questions, which is the <laughs> best. Um, I am a person who, and I know you're also a linguist, uh, you're in that, in that field. And we talked about curiosity. We talked about the brain's malleability and how after around six months or so, it starts, although we are per Dr. Cole, um, the, from a linguistics perspective, we are closing off a little bit when we get to the six month mark and we start honing in or we start really focusing on what language does our caregiver speak? What, what language does um, our, whoever your caregiver is? Um, and I think this is, maybe this isn't just about, this isn't just a question about linguistics. I think it's also a, how, how can you potentially, and this is a big one, how can mm -hmm. you potentially open up what was closed through mm -hmm. whether you whether it's evolution through the de cognitive development um whatever it is how is there a way to open up and and again this isn't just about linguistics i think it's also about like the I think of the implicit bias, te bias test where we're talking about um, relations to weapons. Like, mm -hmm. how can I say black person holding a book, black mm -hmm. person holding a baby? Like mm -hmm. these are real for me as an adoptive parent of two African American children. These are the the rewiring or the I'm just gonna leave it at rewiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh maybe overwriting if we use mm -hmm. a hard disk we say mm -hmm. we're like oh i'm just gonna shoop, overwrite that mm -hmm. how can we open back up and maybe make our brain a little bit more malleable mm -hmm. uh, than than how it is how they are now mm -hmm. that's a wonderful question and the answer is complicated but i think i can give you a few different parts of it the first thing is to say that we now know that neurogenesis, the, we used to think that you're born with all the neurons you were going to have, and then it was really just pruning and connecting. But we now know that neurogenesis happens throughout the lifespan, and we can grow new neurons, and we can form new memories, and we can learn new things throughout our life, and, you know, general things that are related to good health, you know, exercise and eating and sleeping facilitate neurogenesis in terms of the biology. However, there are different systems in the brain that have kind of different lifetimes of plasticity. And we call these experience independent, experience dependent, and experience expectant. So the experience independent parts of your brain are born knowing what they need to do. They regulate the temperature in your body and make your heart beat and, you know, send signals to your you know, sensory systems and stuff like that. They're independent of experience. They're fixed unless something goes wrong. Then you have experience expectant parts of the brain. And those are the ones like um, speech sounds. They're looking for perception. They're looking for um, uh, what the world that you inhabit looks like. And as soon as things stop changing and they feel like they've got a good, pretty good prediction of what your world is like, Plasticity goes down. That's why they say after puberty, um, it's much harder to hear like the tones in other languages. Now, recent research has shown that we can learn, we can learn as native English speakers, we can learn Mandarin tones in adulthood. It's just much harder and it takes much more input and it's harder for some people than others. They're also working on different kinds of drugs that sort of would physically open up those experience expectant regions that are kind of like, okay, I've been on this planet for six months. I've heard this many sounds. I've got them all down. You know, like I'm going to now my, it's in my best interest not to spend time adjusting, but just to keep going. 
Uh, for biases and these kind of like more abstract concepts in the brain, we have experience, what I say, in, expectant, independent, no, dependent, experience dependent. <laughs> there we go. I've got it. Um, and that means these are the areas of our brain that continue to change over our lifespan. So the big reasoning association cognitive areas change, continue to change throughout your lifespan. Now they've, they've got information based on your, you know, they overwrite and adapt to every lived experience, but they can continue to grow and change. So, so at one level, the real question is, is the, are my inputs changing? Because as we get older and as we kind of restrict our experiences and become creatures of habit, are all of even those experience dependent parts of the brain are like, I, there's no part of this day that I could not predict. You know, you're like, Mr. Rogers, I loved Mr. Rogers. I don't know if anyone's of my uh, generation, but you know, puts on a sweater, like today it's a blue sweater and puts on his shoes and sings the song and goes, you know, like if we get like that, we can get like that and our, you know, creatures, creature comforts and our lives can get very predictable. And those parts of the brain are not working hard to update if it's like, I could have predicted everything that you did today. So in terms of just facilitating growth and plasticity, it's a little bit about like, just imagine that your brain's job is to predict, you know, to understand what's happening now and to predict what's going to happen next and how new or unexpected the things that you're feeding it are. If you're just a creature of habit, you know, it, it's not having any big surprises than those parts of the brain that are they're not going to update, right? You're just, you're adding to the, you're reinforcing what you already know. So there's something there about the adapting that really is just exposing yourself to new things, surprising your brain. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So you talked about the different, the, the experience uh, independent? Yeah. Dependent, Expe independent, independent and, and um, expectant. And dependent. Um, do people, st I, th this is what I, one of the things that I get stuck on because I, it feels from a person who is trying to do anti racist education and training and, um, and trying to teach and inform. My question is, do people stop, do people ever stop learning? Does no. it, does it just like, boop, go just like, it's concrete now we're done. No, so they do not. Everyone, everyone has the ability to keep learning. Not keep only going. do they have the ability, I'm, you know, I'm really, I'm 48 <laughs> self-disclosure, just tell you where I'm at in life. You well, know, I think the hardest Mr. Rogers. So yeah, there we go. The right. hardest thing I've done in my life was writing my book. And I did that when I was 45, 46 it was new. Um, and I, and I'm still thinking about like, how do I want to grow? And I, and I think that do people ever stop learning? No. Um, and I think that we might be one of the biggest barriers to our own adult learning in that we consider ourselves to be more static individuals than we are. Like if I was like, what's true of you? I asked my students in the neuroscience of you class to do an exercise, show me who they are. And I let them use any kind of medium they wanted. And then a few weeks later, I said, who are you right now in this moment? And I think that we, thank you for asking that question. Cause actually when I was making the talk, I had this thought and then I forgot, <laughs> but it's part of forgetting is also part of learning, right? I'm changing that we, we use shortcuts and stereotypes and how we understand ourselves too. I mean, we have more data on ourselves than we have on anything else, but we also take shortcuts in the way that we interpret our own actions and decisions. And I think that part of that is seeing yourself as a fixed being when in fact, we're all trajectories, we're all trajectories. And there's, you know, if, if you were a, if you were a, you know, you are a multidimensional being, but rather than putting six labels on you, if I were to put six trajectories on you, 
you know, you're a shape, you're a dynamic. And so, yes, we're all capable of learning. We're all learning. It's just a question of where is, what is motivating? Because again, that dopamine and the rewiring, like what are you motivated to learn about? What are you fearful or defensive or protective about? Um, you know, those things will shape where you learn and where you don't learn and the choices you make. But we're all, I mean, I hope that I made a tiny effect on all of your brains in this in this time we had together, we're all learning. I, I absolutely believe that you have. And I believe that um, for those of you who are viewing this recording in the future, message in a bottle. Um, <laughs> I hope that, that that's the case for you as well. One more question. And this one is a future looking. Uh, I'm not proposing that you have the crystal ball, but um, for your discipline, mm -hmm. uh, for neuroscience, what mm -hmm. does, what is yet to be discovered? What, what does the future look like? Oh my gosh. What is yet to be discovered is almost everything. And, and you important. only have two minutes. So uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that we don't really know what are the, what are the exact properties of all of this activity happening in our, in our brain that give rise to the pieces of these activities that we're consciously aware of. I think that's a really big thing area that we need to understand. Um, and I also think we need to understand and embrace variability. I think that our models of how the brain gives rise to the mind are not only based on averages, but they're based on really non-representative averages of, you know, white Western college undergraduates. And I think that um, understanding neurodiversity as it looks in the population and understanding what environments these brains thrive in is really, I think, going to be transformative in parenting and education and, and just understanding and accepting ourselves and setting ourselves up for success. Did I do it? Yes. You did it. it. Not only did you do it, but you really teed up your, your next talk with us, hopefully. Um, I love it. I could talk to you for another few hours uh, long after the sun goes down uh, on this side of the earth. But thank you so much for, um, and uh, Stephanie, if you want to bring everybody back on um, all of our panelists, you're welcome to. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I am, you, you helped me understand what my brain was doing during COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, which was incredibly therapeutic because I didn't realize what was happening. Uh, and the education has continued. I'm so thankful that we have had this opportunity with you. And um, on behalf of the Doxy Bracy Center for Human Reconciliation, Dr. Pratt, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to close also and thank you for, for being with us this evening and sharing. And one of the things I'm taking away is be more open to, di to differences. Be more open and understanding that we're each tailored very separate. And that uh, because you don't agree with me, you're not necessarily crazy or dumb. <laughs> uh, you're just in another, another space. But again, thank you uh, for such a difficult subject for you to make it kind of simple. I like the animals and all. I could connect with all of that. So thank you again. And thank dogs you. are far better than humans. So I will get that t-shirt and agree with you totally. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that concludes our event. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Let's Talk series event. Have a good one. Bye-bye.